George Galloway, Workers' Party of Britain candidate, 12,003. I do hereby declare that George Galloway is duly... This is for God. Do I respect the Prime Minister? I despise the Prime Minister. Just suck it up. I won the election. Happy Easter, or as President Joe Biden and the White House in Washington put it, Happy Trans Visibility Day, the latest stage of Joe Biden's determined effort to throw the election to Donald Trump in November. And it's rare, you know, but sometimes some people don't wake up from anesthesia. Benjamin Netanyahu is currently in a state of being anesthetized pending an operation for a hernia he didn't know he had until routine medical examination today made an operation tonight inevitable, inescapable, ineluctable and if you believe any of that I have a bridge here in London that I could sell you going cheap. And I've just called on the Speaker of the House of Commons to recall Parliament from holiday to discuss the sensational shock news in the pro-war Observer newspaper today that the British government's own lawyers have advised them that Israel is acting in breach of international law and that therefore ipso facto any and all assistance given by the British government to a government its own lawyers consider to be acting as an international war criminal makes them an accessory after the fact and could lead to their incarceration behind bars in Belmarsh prison perhaps fasten your seatbelts it's going to be a bumpy night as Betty Davis once said because this is the mother of all talk shows. Curious about our curriculum? Have something to say? Then call us now to join the debate on the mother of all talk shows. The only education you can get for free. George Galloway. The mother of all talk shows. With George Galloway, the world is our classroom. And you're welcome to sit in and join the seminar. Well, it's looking like I'm the people's prime minister. Who would be the UK's best prime minister is the topic of the poll this evening. 50,000 people have voted, and I'm only announcing it now, right at the beginning of the show. And well, so far, it's a landslide for me. Not a scientific poll. But nonetheless, quite a straw in the wind that virtually nobody at all considers Sir Keir Starmer as the best Prime Minister Britain could have. Happy Easter. Christ is risen. The resurrection has always inspired Christians around the world, hundreds of millions of Roman Catholics in particular, have fastened on the hope of the resurrection. 
on Good Friday, inaptly called the saddest day of the year, Christians believe that Jesus Christ was crucified on the demand of the Pharisees, the Jewish establishment of the time. Pontius Pilate wanted nothing to do with it. He washed his hands famously of the whole matter, but the ruling elite amongst the Jewish people at the time demanded the death penalty for this rebel, for this outlaw, for this man, this Palestinian Jew who believed in equality, who believed that we should not do unto others uh, unless we would like that done into us, who believed in feeding the multitudes with loaves and fishes that he miraculously procured, who could walk on water, who cured the sick and healed the lame. This great revolutionary figure, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, was put to death on the Friday that we now call Good Friday, but the resurrection followed swiftly. And that kind of thing is what has kept me motivated in more than 50 years in politics. The belief that even in the darkest hour, uh, the dawn is not far away, that even in the worst adversity, uh, that a phoenix can rise from the ashes to mix my cultural metaphors. I believe in Jesus. I believe in his resurrection. I believe that he is the hope of the world. But you don't have to. It's entirely, of course, a personal matter. But I believe in the judgment day. I believe that all of us on the last day will be judged according to what we have done in and with our lives that God gave us. I believe that we'll be judged on that which we did not do, but ought to have done. And that too is a mainspring of my political and moral philosophy. You don't have to. You can believe that the man currently under anesthesia in Tel Aviv this evening, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, will not pay for his sins, will not pay for his crimes. He may evade the uh, hammer of justice in this life, but you'd have to be a pretty hardcore atheist to believe that this man, Netanyahu, will escape eternal damnation for the crimes he's been committing, not just since October the 7th, but indeed throughout his entire political career. But he is not unique. If he dies this evening under anesthetic, and I am religiously precluded from wishing that upon him, if he dies this evening uh, under the surgeon's knife, he'll be replaced by someone who will make no appreciable difference at all, at least not in the medium term. He may, as a result of Washington maneuvering, uh, be uh, prevailed upon to cease the most horrific of the fire, perhaps not invade Rafa, although they are bombarding Rafa from land, sea, and air, an all-out invasion might be averted. To cease the worst aspects of these mass killings that are taking place around the bread vans, which when they arrive are surrounded by starving Palestinians. And every time it happens, day after day, night after night, the Israeli occupation force in Gaza opens fire upon them, killing 10, 20, 50, 60, 90, and hundreds in the worst cases. I just watched a picture of the Rajab family in Gaza City, a family that I know. Yes, a family that I know. The whole family massacred, lying there in the garden against their garden wall. What conceivable justification anyone could adduce for such cold-blooded massacre of an entire family, it's very hard to understand. It's even harder to understand how politicians in Western countries can continue to offer their friendship to a state which is daily, hourly, carrying out 
such obscene massacres, and yet they are. The entire front bench of uh, British politics, the Conservatives, the Labour Party, and the Liberal Democrats, the entire ironclad consensus for Netanyahu and his actions since October 7 appears so far to be untested. Of course, Labour, under pressure from my by-election victory in Rochdale and the prospect of it being repeated in scores of constituencies across the country, are having to revert to ever more weasel-worded uh, falsifications to A, disguise what they were saying over the last six months, and B, to try and pretend that they're calling for something different now, but they are comprehensively failing. Huge demonstrations continue to take place as they have every day, every week in the United Kingdom over the entire period of almost six months. The signs in the elections are that Labour is going to pay a high price for its treason of the deeply held convictions of a huge swathe a big percentage of its core electoral vote, at least if there's any justice that is. But the whistleblowers are now emerging, and those whistleblowers are whistling a tune uh, that may prove very deadly indeed to the British political class. The pro-war Observer newspaper today revealed a recording of a conservative minister telling a conservative audience in a private meeting that the British government's legal advice from its own law officers was that Israel has a been and is in breach of international law, of crimes against humanity, of war crimes, of breaches of the Geneva Conventions and plausibly, according to the ICJ, crossing the threshold of genocide. Now, you may say I'm not shocked about that at all, and you'd be right. It's obvious that Israel is breaking international law. It's obvious that the British government knows that it is, but is continuing to give arms, intelligence cooperation, the right to fly in and out of Britain and of our base in Cyprus, even in the knowledge that those war crimes have been systematically carried out over a period of almost six months. That's obvious. What is not obvious, and what could be a game changer, is that as soon as the British law officers put in writing their considered legal judgment to ministers that those ministers are now acting out with the law because, of course, it is a crime in Britain to be assisting someone who your own legal advisors have adjudged to be in breach of international law. That means that each and every one of the government ministers responsible, principally the Prime Minister, the Foreign Secretary, and the Defence Minister, are themselves guilty of the crime of being an accessory to war crimes, to crimes against humanity. And they will not be able to rely on the defence that they were unaware of Israel's conduct crossing the threshold of these group cluster of crimes because the prosecution will say your own lawyers told you so. And so I have called upon the Speaker of the House of Commons, member of the Labour Friends of Israel, uh, Lindsay Hoyle, to recall Parliament from its rather long Easter holiday and to allow the House of Commons to discuss this leaked legal advice and to question. Well, we can't question the Foreign Secretary because, rather unhelpfully, he's not a member of the House of Commons. 
a point I highlighted in a recent speech I made in Parliament about the missing Foreign Secretary. At a time of grave international crises, multidimensional, across multi-continental conflicts, the elected members of the British Parliament have nobody to question except a rather foppish junior minister by the name of Andrew Mitchell, who's a fine fellow, who's a smart fellow, who's a very hard-working fellow because he's having to do his own job as well as David Cameron's job before Parliament at least. But he's not the Foreign Secretary. The buck doesn't stop with him. The decisions are not made by him. And therefore, questioning him is of rather limited efficacy. But that notwithstanding, the Speaker of the House of Commons has a duty now to recall Parliament with this breaking news, this deeply important and serious news. And so if you are in Britain, I want you to bombard your own member of Parliament with the demand that Parliament be recalled from its long, long Easter holiday so that we can debate this matter. I started out telling you that Joe Biden inexplicably chose Easter Sunday, the day of Jesus' resurrection, a hallowed, the holiest day of all for Christian people, to rebrand Easter Sunday as Trans Visibility Day. I've got nothing against trans people. Visibility didn't seem to me the major problem uh, that they had. Everyone knows that they exist. And when we see them, I don't often myself, but when we see them, they're pretty visible. It was a provocation by Joe Biden to rebrand Easter Sunday as Trans Visibility Day. It was a spit in the eye of the Christian community, and one gathers that there are quite a few Christians even now in the United States of America. Biden sometimes claims to be one of them, claims to be a Roman Catholic, though he is in utter defiance of almost all of the most important parts of Catholic doctrine. He even pooed his pants in front of the Pope in the Vatican, in what was described as a wardrobe incident, but was, well, quite a wardrobe incident, I can tell you from factotums who were present at the time. Biden claims to be a Christian. Why did he choose Easter Sunday to declare Trans Visibility Day? I have no idea unless it is because he thinks that he's already lost the election in November, or unless he knows that meaningfully there isn't going to be an election in November, unless he knows something the rest of us don't know, this studied insult to the Christian community in the United States is likely to be the final nail in his coffin. Now, King Charles was out in public today. Uh, may he live a long life. He's receiving treatment for cancer of an indeterminate nature. We don't know if he's got six weeks, six years, 16 years still to reign over us, but we hope for the best for him. Our darling, Princess Kate, was unable to appear. She was power walking with her husband at a garden center uh, just a weekend or so ago. And then we saw a rather stilted video of her, which many have claimed, I'm not qualified even to begin to take a guess on the veracity of their claims, was not actually all that it was cracked up to be and that AI and the rest had been deployed. I have no idea about that. But I was very much looking forward 
to seeing her today. Make the short walk that the far older King Charles with his cancer was able to make and to sit on the pew next to him. I hope it will not be delayed that we get to see this marvelous, wonderful young mother and the future queen of this land in public again soon. There's going to be a lot of talk about Palestine tonight, but that doesn't mean that we have forgotten the situation in Ukraine. This marks the last day of the presidency of Volodymyr, as he now has it, Zelensky. His presidential term runs out at midnight tonight. He is not under anesthesia as the other turbulent priest that the West would quite like to be seeing the back of, Mr. Netanyahu, but he is on his last day of his legitimate presidency of his country. He has, of course, banned the election, so we have no idea what will happen next in Ukraine except this, that when women, including pregnant women, when young men, including boys, are being thrown as good money after bad into the maw of this horrific war in Ukraine, which should never have been fought, which did not need to have been fought. We know that things are going badly for Zelensky's army, and everyone knows it, though some continue to throw sand in your eyes in the hope of deceiving you. We're still sending the billions. We're still sending the weapons. We're still pretending that everything is hunky-dory in Ukraine's counter-offensive against a much superior adversary in the forces of the Russian Federation. It's high time to bring about a negotiated end to this conflict. And I, when Parliament returns, am going to be pressing hard through every method I can adduce for this conflict now to come to a negotiated end. If the West does not allow ex-President Zelensky, pro tem, interim, or whatever we're now going to call him, now that his presidency has run out. If the West does not allow Zelensky to conclude, conclude a negotiated end to this conflict, not only will they doom hundreds of thousands more Ukrainians to an early grave, they'll be proving that they never cared anything about Ukrainians at all in the first place. Imagine that. It's going to be the mother of all talk shows. Stay tuned. I'll be leading scores of parliamentary candidates and potentially hundreds. Uh, and of course, if they were all to be elected, uh, I might have enough uh, support to become the prime minister. But unfortunately in this country, uh, we don't elect the Prime Minister directly. If we did, uh, we might be better off. We've got a Prime Minister for whom nobody at all voted at any level anywhere. He was not even elected by his own members of Parliament. But our Prime Minister is appointed uh, by the King, if he's still there, on the uh, basis that they can command the loyalty, the majority, uh, loyalty uh, on the floor of the House, which would be of the order of 325, 326 MPs. Um, it's exceedingly unlikely that that will ever be me. Uh, what I'm concentrating on trying to achieve is that it is not clear who has got the majority of seats, who will be able to form, form a government. In other words, I'm trying to bring about a hung parliament in which people like me, like you, uh, will have some negotiating room, will have some trading room.
to give our vote 4 p.m. to the person who uh, acknowledges and accepts and is ready to implement some of the key demands that we have, the foremost of which is peace, an end to Britain's role as a perpetual war monger, as the tale of the American war dog. Uh, but there are many other demands that we have also. Uh, I am running to be Prime Minister in the sense that I will be leading a long, long list of Workers' Party parliamentary candidates. And if they were all to be elected, well, then we'd be flying. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Okay, here's the poll. Who would be UK's best Prime Minister? Rishi Sunak, Sir Keir Starmer, or George Galloway? Myself, yours truly. You can vote on my Telegram channel, t.me forward slash George Galloway, on my Twitter, on the YouTube community poll, and on the YouTube stream. If you are watching the show on the YouTube stream, or indeed on Facebook, or any other platform, that allows you to do so, please share it now with all of your friends, all of your contacts, and make sure you have subscribed to my YouTube channel. If you want to comment on the things that have been said or not said, uh, it's free of charge, toll free in the US and Canada, plus one eight four four nine four four double three double four. It's free of charge in the UK and Ireland too. It's 0808196552. And the worldwide number is 442039662625. Now, Lara Elborno is a Palestinian American international lawyer, an activist, and co host of the Palestine Pod. She has been one of the most popular guests on the mother of all talk shows over the last six months. And I'm glad to say she joins me again uh, this evening. Lara, thank you uh, for doing that. Um, I ask you this in your lawyer capacity. I've asked you it before. Uh, you, you cautioned me or counseled me uh, to await developments, but developments there have been none. Uh, the ICC has still not charged a single person in Israel for what the ICJ said was plausibly the crime of genocide, the ultimate crime in the human canon of law. The ICJ gave Israel 30 days to report back on progress made to the uh, summary demands that the court made on the Israeli government. But if they ever did get back to them, and I'm unaware if they did or they didn't, absolutely nothing has happened as a result of Israel's patent, transparent, not failure, but refusal to implement the demands of the court. And lastly, if you like, the last bit of the lipstick drawn on the pig of the international legal system, the Security Council decided, with no votes against, to demand a ceasefire in the uh, Gaza conflict. And again, ceasefire has been there none. So to what extent are we all, especially you as an international lawyer, to what extent are we all just wasting our time imagining that there is any system of international law? Well, thank you again for having me, George. Um, I think it's important for us to keep in mind that the law on its own is not going to lead us to freedom. We need every state uh, that has relations with Israel at this moment to sanction Israel with urgency. What we need is efforts by those with power to use their power to put pressure on Israel 
in order to force it to comply with its international obligations, obligations which you've summarized very clearly, the obligation to comply with the six provisional measures that were ordered by the International Court of Justice in January, which Israel has violated every single day since then. And by the way, the International Court of Justice ordered even new provisional measures on March 28th, which barely have been spoken about, um, ordering Israel to ensure the delivery of humanitarian aid to Gaza as a result of what the court considered were new circumstances on the ground. In other words, the starvation in Gaza caused by Israel's policy and its continued violations of international law. Um, so it's really important for us to keep in mind that while these developments are taking place um, in, in the in the legal sphere, um, in, in, in these international institutions, in and of themselves, they're not going to force Israel to comply with its international obligations so long as Israel continues to have um, the full support and backing of the United States, which has affirmed time and again that for Israel, there are no red lines. And so then it falls on all the rest of us to use whatever power we have um, in order to force Israel to comply. And that means full sanctions on Israel as as of right now. That's exactly what we need. I mean, we had in at the end of February, we had dozens of UN experts come out and say that any transfer of weapons to Israel for use in Gaza must cease immediately. That was the end of February. And since then, countries have continued to send weapons to Israel, including the United States, which just a few days ago um, approved new uh, weapons transfers to Israel, um, including 1,800 2,000 pound bombs, which by the way, these, these particular bombs can kill people 300 meters away and were the focus of South Africa's complaint before the ICJ um, uh, when it argued that Israel was com uh, committing genocide in Gaza. Um, and, and the U.S. continues to send the exact same weapons, which are um, allowing Israel to carry out this genocide. So um, I, I have to remind people, it falls on us. The enforcement aspect of all of international law falls on those with power to force Israel to comply with its international obligations. So all these allied governments of Israel, your government, my government, in the vanguard, although Germany also uh, is, in, Germany is in fact the second largest contributor of, uh, of lethal military aid to Israel after the United States, uh, these governments, Germany, Britain, America, they are all acting in uh, flagrant uh, denial and contempt for the very international institutions that they themselves are members of, aren't they? Yes, absolutely. I mean, we 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 see this time and again. I mean, if you look at just the U.S.'s response, um, for example, to the the U.N. Security Council resolution, they went on a media campaign arguing that the resolution was not binding. Uh, you know, but this is like arguing that the sky is not blue. Um, uh, you, there's not a single international law expert, um, you know, that's worth you know any you know mention who would agree with that position. Um, Article 25 of the UN Charter is crystal clear that the resolutions of the UN Security Council are binding. And yet we see the US time and again um, create arguments so that it can find a way out for Israel um, in order to shield Israel from any accountability so that Israel can persist in its violations. Um, and this is an extremely dangerous approach because what it does is it undermines the entire system um uh you know of international law this entire framework that has been established uh post world war ii precisely in order to um prevent mass atrocities like genocide and uh, so yes of course the the u.s is in violation of its own obligations it's complicit in this genocide uh, it has an obligation under the genocide convention not only to not be complicit, but also to prevent genocide. And through every single one of its actions, by continuing to fund Israel, by continuing to provide it with the weapons necessary to um, um, carry out this genocide, and in general, by uh, shielding it diplomatically on the international stage by having vetoed two previous UN Security Council resolutions, it is in violation of all of those obligations. Now, the British government uh, is in trouble today as a result of uh, leaked audio of a minister admitting 
uh, to a private audience of Conservative uh, Party members that the government's own lawyers had in writing advised them that Israel was in breach of multiple uh, international laws and that, uh, I'm paraphrasing now, I don't know if she said this, but it, it follows as night follows day, uh, that therefore the British government is acting illegally uh, in continuing to give weapons, to have intelligence cooperation in a secret military protocol uh, that it has made with Israel, which it will not publish, will not show even to elected members of parliament like me, and that uh, ipso facto uh, British government ministers uh, are now open themselves to prosecution for military and intelligence cooperation with a uh, country which its own lawyers have decreed to be in breach of the law. Yeah, I mean, George, this really just exposes the continuing double standards and hypocrisy that are really at play um, and and really form the foundation of U.S. and U.K. policy and, and the policy of, you know, Western governments more broadly when it comes to uh, Israel, when it comes to um, the Palestinian struggle for freedom. Um, they will adopt any approach, um, any arguments um, necessary to uh, allow them to sustain their support for Israel and to, um, you know, allow them to continue to undermine Palestinian rights. Um, and this is the unfortunate reality that we deal with as Palestinians who continue um, after seven, you know, for seven decades now, for over seven decades now, to struggle for our freedom. And, and you know, I have to remind that um, you know, it's really important for us not to lose sight of the fact that at, at, at the heart of it, the Palestinian struggle is one for freedom. And Israel's biggest violation of Palestinian rights is its violation of the right of 14 million Palestinians worldwide to self-determination, to determine our own futures collectively as a people on our own land. And, um, you know, we, I think we get caught up in like, this current moment, this genocide, accountability for this genocide, what will that look like? Um, but we have to remember that this genocide is, is, is taking part within this context of over 75 years of apartheid, of ethnic cleansing, um, of occupation, um, of settler colonialism, and that the only way to redress all of the violations that are encapsulated in this very oppressive framework that Palestinians live under is freedom. Um, you know, uh, uh, enforcing and allowing Palestinians the right to self-determination, which is our right, by the way, but it's been violated for, for decades. And, and that needs to stop. That is the only way to end this conflict. If a man from Mars landed now, I suspect the first question he would ask is the question, why? Why are all these Western governments uniquely ready to collaborate in crimes against humanity, which are crimes even in their own country, which leave themselves open to prosecution as accessories after the fact of those crimes? Why are they prepared to bend, break any law, any convention, any any figment of uh, righteousness. Why for this little country, seven, eight million people on the Mediterranean, thousands of miles away from themselves, why, Lara? Well, you look, there's a lot of scholars who've written a lot about this subject who can probably articulate this better than me, but I think you know, what I can say about this is that Palestine really reveals that we continue to live in a very colonial reality, um, that, you know, Israel is a U.S. military outpost in the Middle East, um, that Israel se uh, secures and safeguards U.S. interests in the Middle East, um, and whether that is just in terms of the influence that um, the U.S. can, uh, you know, yield in the Middle East through Israel's presence, or through things like resource theft. We all know that there are hundreds of billions uh, of dollars of gas off of the coast of Gaza, which has been unexplored 
now for decades, and which just a few weeks into this current genocidal assault, Israel awarded gas exploration licenses to four of the largest gas companies in the world, including BP. Um, um, and that took place in parallel with this genocidal assault. And nobody even stopped to question whether Israel had the right to do this, whether it even had the right to the very resources that it was awarding gas exploration licenses for, right? So, um, you know, it's a combination of all of these things, the resource theft, the, you know, the influence, the power. Um, and, and, and unfortunately, although many people, you know, like to believe that we live in this post-colonial reality. I think Palestine has has revealed for us that we certainly do not. Um, and 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 I've heard a lot of people talk about how um, there's been an unveiling in this moment. How many of the the values that we thought that the countries that we lived in um, actually espoused, we actually realize they don't espouse those values because of the what, how we've seen those countries um, position themselves with respect to this genocide. Um, and so it's it's on us to continue to do everything that we can um, to struggle for a better world, a better future, one where people are free. Well, I know that you will, so will I. And let's uh, talk again as this situation, this story develops. Lara Albono, always a pleasure to see you on the Mother Thank of you, World George. Talk Show. And congratulations Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lara. Who would be the UK's best Prime Minister? Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer, or me, yours truly? 54,000 people have now voted on this poll. Uh, now, let me take a quick break, and then it's Terry in Liverpool who disagrees with me. And they are always welcome calls. Stay tuned. On YouTube, Keith Mitchell says, Your success in Rochdale has made many, many more than just those who voted for you. As Roger Waters' mum says, do the right thing, George. Keep right with those in Rochdale and they will stand by you at the general election. I want to thank the great Roger Waters for his fulsome support in the contest. I want to thank Low Key, our own considerable genius, for coming to Rochdale and performing so brilliantly, so dazzlingly, in the constituency. I want you all to write this down. I was listening today to Low Key's track, Long Live Palestine. And I always knew that it was musically extremely beautiful and inspiring. You know, the one with the chorus, free, free Palestine. But today, for some reason, in a car, I played it and I listened very carefully to the lyrics, which proved to me again that Loki isn't just a recording artist, isn't just an indefatigable activist. He is a professorial political genius. So write it down, Long Live Palestine. Watch it on Spotify at the end of this show by Loki, L-O-W-K-E-Y. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Let's hit the phone lines and go to Liverpool first to hear from Terry. Go ahead, Terry. Hi. Hi, George. I want to say I love you. I love Gayatri and all your children. I hope you're having a, a great Easter. And I've rang to take Thank issue you so with you, much, which my I, friend, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've got, I've, I've rang to take issue with you, which I don't normally do. But as a Republican, what I want to say is that um, King Charles, and he's got his his <clears throat> problems and his medical problems, and I wouldn't wish any any ill on anybody. But if he really thought about the people of this country, he would put all his wealth into the National Health Service and support all the people that are on waiting lists to have medical treatment done. Well, of course, I agree with every word of that, Terry. Uh, you're not more Republican than me. 
uh, I argued uh, throughout the later years of the late Her Majesty the Queen's uh, reign that uh, upon her demise, uh, there had to be a referendum so the British people could choose uh, whether or not to continue the often now farcical nature uh, of this rather troubled family uh, escaping billions in taxation, receiving hundreds of millions in remuneration uh, for living in castles and palaces maintained entirely at our expense. Uh, I'm with you on all of that. Uh, the facts are, though, that as far as we can tell, a majority of our fellow citizens uh, believe in the monarchy. I call for a referendum full in the expectation that I would not win it, though I would give it everything to try and secure a Republican majority in that referendum. But we haven't got a referendum, but we have got a monarchy. And on uh, human terms, of course, as you did and I do, uh, we don't wish ill on the current uh, incumbent monarch. Uh, we have a right, I think, to say we should know more uh, about his medical prognosis. He is, after all, the head of state. This is not some, uh, <clears throat> you know, forbidden city in uh, ancient dynastic Beijing uh, where the common people had no right to know uh, what was going on behind the walls uh, of the Forbidden City. This is supposed to be a constitutional uh, democracy, a constitutional monarchy, a parliamentary democracy, as we are paying, and uh, so much of our constitution requires uh, the uh, participation of an unelected monarch. We're entitled to know how the unelected monarch is doing and if he's going to be with us for much longer. That's perhaps the only area of disagreement. But I'm grateful, Terry, for your kind thoughts. Uh, podcast read, it says here, the Moats podcast is going great guns all over the world, in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, even in Europe. It's quite extraordinary. Uh, we're, we're, one of the, we're in the charts in the Netherlands. Uh, we're in the charts in Germany. We are top or near the top of the charts in some of the most unlikely places. Uh, in Africa, for example, the numbers have been huge this week. We're in the top five in Nigeria, Uganda, and Ghana. We're in the top five in Qatar and the UAE. And we're in the charts in France and Spain uh, this week. So listen, you can download the podcast and all previous podcasts just by putting your phone up against that QR code on your screen right now. I promise you, you can thank me for it later. Let's go to New York, who wouldn't, where Ellie wants to talk about tyrants and solidarity. I'm always up for that, Ellie. Go ahead. Hello? Mr. Hi, Galloway. Ellie, you're on the air. Go ahead. Good evening, yes. Mr. Galloway. First of all, I would love to congratulate you uh, and the people of Rochdale for this crucial and inspiring win. Here in New York, we need someone like you to save us from this madness. And, um, well, I have Thank been a, an independent voter uh, that has voted for Democrats, apparently to save the day. But now we end up with a genocide um, being um, supported and promoted by a fellow Catholic, which is a horrible embarrassment. Um, so in this regard, I would love to thank you and express my admiration for your sense of independence and autonomy, uh, which has guided you throughout uh, all these years in, in politics. Uh, thank you for the work you've done for the Palestinians. Um, again, I'm calling you from New York. And I have discovered this book uh, by uh, Etienne de la Boissie, which uh, wrote Voluntary Servitude, and it's a great work uh, which discusses uh, the causes of why a few people, a few tyrants, rule the masses. 
uh, you were just speaking with Miss uh, Lara Elborno um, about it, uh, asking why why are we uh, um, under the yoke of a few people, and uh, that's because I think uh, according to Etienne de la Boisi, because we allow it. Um, we need to understand the importance of unity. That has to be for a That's cause. That's uh, very beautiful, <laughs> very beautiful, Ellie. Perhaps the uh, answer to the question from the man from Mars is merely because they can, because we allow them to. That's why they do it. Thank you for your beautiful call, beautiful accent, and your lovely words. Uh, just Call Me Anon says, I just subscribed to Lara Elborno's podcast. I can't believe I didn't know about it before today. Well, there you go. Glad to be of service. Aidan McDougall says, how are they at the Olympics? The Olympics started yet? I noticed that they're not allowing any Russian or Belarusians there, but Israeli athletes will be there, uh, no doubt. Back to the lines, it's Declan. In Dublin, on Israel. Go ahead, Declan. Uh, hello, George. <clears throat> First of all, um, I'd like to thank the voters of Rochdale for for uh, voting for you. Now, uh, the reason I'm, I'm singling you. out the actual voters is because uh, they did a great thing, uh, and you know, millions of people worldwide uh, would salute them. They they gave their voice. Now, as regards your voice, George, um, 10 years ago on Easter Sunday, I, I burst in with the Syrian army and Hezbollah into the fabled Christian Syrian town of Malula, where they speak Aramaic, the language Jesus spoke. And as soon as the Syrian army liberated what was left of it, it vanished from the Western media, never to be heard of uh, again. In the last few days, uh, the Israeli army, uh, Air Force, bombed uh, the Zainab area for the umpteen time of Damascus. Now, Zainab is the daughter of the Prophet Muhammad, and uh, uh, it's a big Shia area. They, they're big into their shrines and um, you know, uh, pilgrimages and stuff like that. And Hezbollah uh, have to guard every single Shia area because they're, uh, they suffer from continual Israeli attacks and suicide bomb attacks and so on. Now, uh, my gripe is with the, uh, in particular, uh, the Irish and the British media. Um, in this case, uh, RTE, uh, Ireland's BBC equivalent, started to go on that this shrine was a Hezbollah stronghold, um, which is you know, which is not. They they have to guard it. It, it, it. It's it's women and children who have survived previous outrages uh, live there, and um, uh, the media. You see, George. Um, you you know you're very articulate, but. Even the less articulate people would say there's things we shouldn't do, like 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 push children into gas ovens and stuff like that, right? Now, in the BBC and its little sidekick here in in Ireland, they they regard Gaza at the moment and Syria and and the West Bank as some kind of a philosophical uh, Hamlet type debating. You know, is it is it right to starve them to death and? Uh, how, how many calories should we leave in a day? I'm, I'm speaking over the last few days. And one can be as articulate as you. There aren't all that many people as articulate as you uh, or your your last guest. But as long as, as, long as the uh, modern equivalents of their Stumer, uh, Hitler's media outlet, in the BBC and RTE and so on, and the same in America continue, these 
outrageous against the very base, basis of humanity uh, will continue. The Christians and Muslims of, of, of Gaza are still trying to go to what's left of their churches and, 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 and mosques. The fact that they have to run around for, for pieces of flour in the dirt is um, an insult to us. Uh, several months ago, you had that little little girl uh in Gaza, walking along in her little princess dress. And if your child asked you to uh, explain that to her, you couldn't, because nobody could. All you you could do is is say, I will protect you to your own daughter, right? Now, it's up to us. However, to do it, I don't know, uh, and and your your excellent Palestinian speaker doesn't know. But we ha- we have a duty not to be Hitler's willing executioners, not to be Netanyahu's willing executioners, or or or, or the idiots uh, Macron. Uh, Sunak, I have to think of the idiot's name and, 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 and the moron we have here uh, in charge. I could go on about this, but it's it's just, you know, I, I, I uh, people go on about the Holocaust and, and, and all the rest of it, but we're living it every day and those media people in particular and the politicians are complicit in it and making us complicit in it too. So that's my that's my thing, Absolutely, George. Declan. Such a powerful call. Uh, I have been many times in Malula, uh, the uh, Christian hamlet uh, where they speak Aramaic, the language of Jesus. Uh, I've been there many times. Uh, it is the holiest place I have ever been. Uh, and I've been many times in the Vatican, in St. Peter's Square, but I never was in any place where spiritually I felt that God was near uh, as Malula. And of course, we both know, you and I, uh, the the nuns who uh, suffered so much at the hands of uh, Western-backed ISIS and Al-Qaeda mass murderers, the priests who were beheaded, uh, even a bishop Uh, was beheaded uh, by these mass murderers, every one of them back to the nth degree by also civilized Western governments, some of whom even pretend to be Christians. Thank you, Declan, for that uh, amazing call. Uh, Citrus One says, George, please bring back Craig Murray. He has important information on the Julian Assange case. And SM says, George, thank you for being mature enough to be open and listening to those who disagree with you, unlike some other talking heads which should mature enough before entering the social media. Thank you for that. And uh, RCW says, Galloway has the biggest live chat I've ever seen. Uh, Well, thanks. I'm sure that that's uh, true. Cyrus Shirazi says, God bless the people of Rochdale for voting for GG. I mean, Cyrus, thank you for that. And Concerned Citizen says, China should lease Gaza the way Britain leased Hong Kong. And uh, Concerned Citizen also left a very kind donation of five US dollars. Much obliged to you. Let's go to Eve in Florida on the Moscow attack. Go ahead, Eve. Hello, George. Yes, I am going to try to prove to you that it's absolutely normal that the Russian accuse the United States to be complicit in the Moscow attack. Let's suppose that mm-hmm. you, are, you put yourself in the mind of one of the terrorists, the 7th of March, and you have you, you have this terrorist, and you see on your TV that the United States has issued a warning for 48 hours in Moscow. So it's a pre- pretty precise warning for a terrorist attack, and recommend the, the the U.S. people in Moscow not to attend a concert. You are the terrorist. You think that you have been outed. 
And you think that even if the relation between the Russia and uh, U.S. are bad, the, uh, the U.S. is going to, um, to give some information, some secret information, to the Indian, to the Chinese, to the Brazil, to South Africa, and they will pass it back to Moscow. So the terrorist is going to say, we have, been, we have a chance to have been outed. We have to go back to our handler and call off this attack. But the attack was not called off. And that means that the, the handler of those terrorists convey to the terrorists, told them, look, the U.S. Has, has given no information about your identity. And that proves that the, it gives a, a very strong uh, presumption that the U.S. is in on this terrorist attack. That's uh, the, the point I, I am making. Well, I, I don't know of anyone outside the fevered, uh, um, fevered liars in the uh, Western media and their uh, political bubble in which they all comfortably live together who does not believe uh, that the United States and Western governments and through their proxy the Zelensky regime in Ukraine was not involved in the mass murder, in the Crocus uh, theater. It, it stretches all credulity to believe that the Ukraine, which has conducted multiple terrorist attacks inside Russia before and openly admitted them, blowing people's heads off in cafes, uh, uh, suicide bombing, forcing a driver against his knowledge and will, uh, to drive across the Kerch Bridge with a truck uh, unknowingly full of explosives, which then blew up the bridge, uh, which is now acknowledged is purely a civilian bridge. The murder of uh, Alexander Dugin's uh, daughter uh, in, in her car, a car bomb destined for uh, her father, but tragically taking the life of uh, a young woman in the prime of her life. Multiple terrorist attacks in Belgorod and elsewhere have taken place from Ukraine. So why would you not suspect that the attack on the theater was one of those terrorist attacks? Even before you knew that the terrorists who carried out were on their way to the Ukrainian border when they were apprehended. Even when you knew that every sinew was strained over the first hour of this atrocity to persuade everyone that it was ISIS and not Ukraine what had done it. How could they know within one hour that it was ISIS what done it? How could they know within one hour that Ukraine had no part of it. Western countries can't decide who killed President Kennedy in 1963, but they knew within one hour that it was ISIS what done it in the theater in Moscow. That's before you even look at the distinctly un-ISIS characters uh, that uh, carried out the atrocity who did not perish as ISIS terrorists do but who wanted to flee to Ukraine to enjoy the vast sums of currency and cryptocurrency transferred to them in the weeks before the crime was committed. Well, I've gone over the hour right after this short break. It's one of the most important guests you're going to find anywhere on the media. Miko Pellet, Israeli author and activist, coming up in the second hour. Stay tuned.
there is hope. The hope is in our numbers. We're already boycotting all kinds of products and it's working. They're all reporting significant drops in profit. We need to boycott. We need to protest often in numbers and with imagination. When we get the opportunity to vote out the parties that are supporting the genocide, we must take them. And if that opportunity isn't yet available in your area, you need to make it. You need to join with people intelligently, shrewdly, in a way that will punish the incumbent genocide enabler. You can link up your church with another church, your trade union with another trade union, your community organization, your nursery, whatever, with another in Palestine. You need to reach out to them so that they know that people in Canada and in Britain and everywhere in the world are thinking about them because that is important for their morale. We're entitled to feel a kind of gut-wrenching sadness at what is going. We're entitled for our hearts to be broken, but we're not entitled to allow our spirits to be broken because the people there are depending on our spirit. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. So who are you voting for as the UK's best prime minister? Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer or me? You can vote on Telegram, on Twitter, on the YouTube community poll, and on the YouTube stream. Uh, almost 57,000 people have now voted. And it's looking good for me. Put it this way, Gayatri's measuring up the curtains in 10 Downing Street right now. Now, an old friend of mine, a frequent guest of mine, and an authority uh, of global significance on the Israel-Palestine issue is Miko Pellet. His father uh, was a general in the Israeli army. Miko Pellet himself served in the Israeli army. But now, and for a long time, he's been in the army of justice, shedding light on the criminal nature of the apartheid state of Israel. And I'm glad, and you should be too, that he's back on the mother of all talk shows. This evening, Miko, uh, first of all, I have the melancholy duty of inquiring as to the health of the Israeli Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu. Are you able to enlighten us in any way? First of all, first things first, I haven't congratulated you yet on your victory in the election. So not not for personally anyway, not not like this. So uh, you've given, first of all, so congratulations. You've given hope to a lot of people. In, in communities of conscience that have given up on on the uh, political on their own political systems here and, and everywhere, so it's yeah. it's wonderful to see you, uh, back in parliament. As to Netanyahu, uh, I I don't really I don't know anything more than anybody else know. I think that uh, if we're talking about his mental health, I think that's uh, that's something for experts to um, <laughs> to examine. Um, because clearly he's a, he's a genocidal maniac. But other than that, I really don't know. I can't. There's nothing more that I can, that, that I know. Well, let's uh, let's speculate. Uh, sometimes people don't wake up from anesthesia. Sometimes operations go wrong. Uh, sometimes the patient fades away uh, at a man of his age after uh, surgery, which must have uh, been a very rapid one because we haven't heard anything about the eminence of it until uh, he was already under the, the anesthetic. Uh, let's speculate. I pointed out at the beginning of the show that if he were not to wake up or not to be able to continue as Prime Minister, it would, really wouldn't make very much difference because all of the gang around him are at least as bad as he is. Am I right in that? 
Yes, I mean, he basically created a political structure that has no that that has done away with an opposition. There's no opposition. So, um, you know, when uh, the, the, the Senator Chuck Schumer, or Schumer, the senator from New York, spoke in the, in the Senate, uh, when was it last week or something, the calling for Israeli elections, you thought, what would be the point of that, number one? I mean, they're all the same. They're all in the same boat. They've always all agreed on the issue of Palestine. There's never been any dissent one way or the other. Um, and there's nobody else to vote for because everybody has been either a, a prime minister or a minister of defense or a minister of something else in Netanyahu's government over over time. So there's really no other option to vote for. So might as well go with Netanyahu because at the end of the day, he's even when he loses the election, he is the only one that's capable of putting together a coalition, which is really the magic. The magic is not winning or getting the most votes. In Israeli politics, it's knowing how to, you know, thread a coalition together. And there's nobody who does it better than him. And I say this again, you probably remember, I mean, there were times where he actually, his party did not have the most votes. And yet, because they were not able to put together a coalition, he ended up being the prime minister because he was able to make the deals. He's the best horse trader. He's the best politician Israeli in the Israeli political sphere. And, um, you know, the, like I said, if it was somebody else, and like you said, it would really make no difference whatsoever on the outcome, certainly not when it comes to the Palestinians. I'm uh, a believer of that just as a surgeon cannot operate on his own foot, uh, neither can we expect any significant change from inside Israel itself. For the reasons you have adumbrated, but also because of the the disappearance of huge parts of the uh, of the Israeli political uh, movements, Yesh Gavul and uh, movements for justice of all kinds, which were once in their tens of thousands in Israel. I used to hang out with them in Shankin Street in Tel Aviv, uh, just off the beach. I have fond memories of it, but. They now live in Lisbon. They now live in Paris. They live in the United States. Uh, or they have uh, somehow lost the will to fight. Now, the vast majority of Israelis believe in the annihilation of the Palestinian people in Gaza. That's the sorry truth, isn't it? Yes, uh, I think um, again, one, one more reason that Netanyahu is still relevant is because he's doing exactly what his voters want him to do. They want him to hit. And I remember, you know, I remember people saying this years and years ago, uh, years ago, long before there was a siege, long before, I mean, there's always been a siege, in fact, but long before the official siege on Gaza, um, we need to get in there and just wipe them all out. We need to just wipe, and this was not coming from extremists. This was not coming from fanatics. This was just people talking. There's people talking. We need to get in there and flatten the place and just kill all of them. And I would wonder, who are these? You know, where, where does this where, where does this come from? And so you're right. This is this is now uh, this is the this is the 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 legitimate discourse on every level in the press, on the television, in the streets. When you look at the social media, you know, some of the just the, just a casual you know popular social media platforms, people posting their own stuff. Not necessarily the propaganda, but just the you know the, just the common things that people post. The discourse is just so horrific and racist, and um, you, you know I think I've said this to you before. I've never compared what Israel has done to the Nazis or to the Holocaust, but now it's just it's just so obvious. The discourse, the racism, the the, <laughs> the what they're doing in Gaza. I mean, this mass mass killing of civilians. They become Nazis, or maybe they were always Nazis, and now this has come. This has brought it out into the open. But this is, I think, how we need to start talking about it, so that the world understands. Uh, you know, in the break earlier, there was a thing about you talking about the need to boycott and how it works. People need to understand why boycotting Israel is so important, why sanctions against Israel are, is so important, because they are like Nazis now. They're behaving and speaking like Nazis. It's time they need to pay a price. They need to be stopped. 
It is literally a genocidal project, isn't it, if the definition of genocide is to extirpate, either through annihilation or transfer or mass deportation uh, out of their own land, from their own property, out of the country altogether. I mean, no one could dispute that that is Israel's policy and what Israel is right now doing in Gaza. That's true. And people think that genocide is, you know, rounding people up and putting them in ovens or, or, or you know, gassing people. Genocide, the, the, actually the definition of the crime of genocide has many aspects to it. And when you take it, and I've done this out of just because I was curious, when you look at the definition of the crime of genocide and you juxtapose it with what has been happening in Palestine the last 76, 80 years uh, to, you know, 75, 76 years, um, it's almost like somebody in the in the Zionist organizations took a, took a took a piece of paper and just wanted to put a check mark next to each and every item that defines genocide. Because that's just about the people. It's not just about the killing. It's about the the mass deportation. It's about the destruction of the country. It's about the destruction of a culture and the destruction of a history or the erasure of the history and so on. So there are several aspects to what genocide actually means. And they have checked each and every box as though by intentionally. And so we've got the intent, obviously, which, which is made obvious by their actions. Uh, we have the intent, which we hear all the time in their in their speech and what people are saying. And not, not only today, going back 75 years. I mean, the intent to destroy Palestinians, get rid of Palestinians is nothing new. It's just that it has a slightly different character today. And so we have a genocidal regime that the world allowed to, you know, commence its genocide so just three years after the end of the genocide of the Jews in Europe, just after the end of the Holocaust, they allowed this genocide to to, to begin in Palestine, and um, and you wonder, well, at what point are people going to wake up and say, well, genocide is genocide, and it's time to stop it, and it's time to treat it like genocide. So I always argue with people who are calling for ceasefire because ceasefire is not the appropriate, and it is not the appropriate response to genocide. And Israel has signed how many, you know, ceasefire agreements since the initial, the initial uh, ceasefire of 1949 of January, February of 1949, which basically established the borders of the state of Israel and and eliminated the Palestinians from any process because these agreements were signed with the countries that border Palestine, but there but nothing with Palestinians. And ever since then, and of course, those are violated very, very quickly. And ever since then, Israel has violated every every agreement. So this is this is the reality, and this is something that Israelis have always voted for. Israeli society have always agreed with this, with with some, with very few exceptions. So we, just as we know why the scorpion stings, because it's a scorpion, we know why colonists believe uh, and behave rather towards uh, those they have colonized because they are colonists. Uh, the bigger question for me, I asked this of Lara Alborno earlier, uh, and she couldn't really answer, and I can't answer, maybe you can. If, the, if a man from Mars arrived uh, and looked at the situation, he would not be puzzled by why the Israeli settler state is doing what it's doing. But he might be questioning of why all these other Western governments are prepared to disrupt their own interests, their own friendships and alliances and even prosperity for the sake of that little uh, colonizing power. They didn't do it to maintain French colonial power in Algeria. Uh, they didn't even do it to maintain uh, French or subsequently American colonial power in Vietnam. Why are they ready, it seems, to break themselves on the wheel of Israeli exceptionalism, Israeli supremacism? Genuinely puzzles me that, Miko. It's a very, very important question. And it... Um... The Zionists have learned from all these other experiences that you've mentioned and others. <laughs> and for the past hundred years, they have invested heavily in creating relationships and developing an influence 
with education systems, not only in America, but certainly in Britain and in other countries in Europe, where investing and developing relationships with the press in, in you know, all the different cultural spheres in every country in the West, certainly with politicians and a political process, so that when people are raised in you know Western democracies or you know generally in the West, although not exclusively, because this is true in Latin America and to a large degree it's true in Africa as well, people are raised to be Zionists even if they don't realize it. The Zionist education is prevalent and exists across the board everywhere. The reason everybody is a Zionist is because that is what they see. It's what they see in, 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 in all aspects of culture. It's what they learn in all levels of, of their education system. It's what is in movies and in, 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 in literature. It's what's in the press, mostly. So people are genuinely, uh, I think, Zionists, even if they don't understand, if they don't realize it. Now, on top of that, there has never been anything even remotely similar to 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 uh, present the Palestinian story, the Palestinian case. It's not doesn't exist here in America. I know for a fact, half the people you talk to, if you say Palestine, they confuse it with Pakistan. And then beyond that, the people who do know that there's a Palestine know absolutely nothing about it. So when somebody becomes a, a decides to become a politician and runs for office, this is the baggage they bring. So for them to support Israel is completely natural. It actually makes perfect sense for politicians in the West to be pro-Israeli because that's all they know. That's all they've ever learned. And it's true for the public too. So suddenly we come up and we say, you have to boycott Israel. And they say, you want to boycott the only Jewish state, the only democracy in the Middle East? You must be anti-Semitic. There's no context. They don't know what you and I know. They have not been educated in this way. So why would they possibly not support Israel? I think actually the support for Israel in the West, and again, like I said, Latin America is very, very strong, and, and in Africa it's very, very strong now, is uh, is perfectly normal. It's perfectly natural. The pro What we need to do is we need to double our efforts because we have the truth, we have history, and we have international law on our side. And we need to double our efforts so that what we're seeing in the street, what we're seeing in the popular support for Palestine, which always existed, we need to find a way to elevate it so that it enters the halls of power, so that it enters the, the boardrooms of the press and, and the boardrooms of the you know people who create culture and, and popular culture and so forth. We have not made that transition. And until we do, we're not going to see different results because the education is basically a Zionist education, a pro-Israel education, and it's and it's very, very deep. It's very it's fundamental. I was reading uh, something today uh, about the demise of uh, they went down fighting, but they did suffer uh, the demise of the Comanche people uh, of original Americans, uh, finally uh, wiped out by the New Mexican militias and the Seventh Cavalry and all the rest of the paraphernalia of the American settler state. And my son asked me, Daddy, what's a Comanche? Uh, in other words, uh, the Comanche are in the museum. Uh, they are something that old men like me uh, read about. Arafat always said, maybe even said it to you, he said it to me a thousand times, uh, we are not the Red Indians, he would say. We're not going to go into the museum of X nations like the Comanche. Uh, sometimes uh, one loses hope uh, that this can all be reversed, uh, but it is hope is returned by the absolute determination of the Palestinian people themselves not to go into that museum. Do you feel that? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, people ask me all the time, what keeps you going? What inspires you? And I'm like, what do you mean what inspires me? Look at the Palestinian people. Look at the people in Gaza. Uh, how can you not be inspired? And I think you, this is also in the break. I mean, you, your voice was saying we don't have the luxury to lose our, to, to, to let our spirit, to let them, you know, let our spirit down. How could we possibly lose hope 
when we see the Palestinian people and their accomplishments and their spirit and their and their not just their desire to life, but the dignity that they maintain under such horrific, horrific conditions, they're subjected now to such horrors that are even unprecedented in in the Palestinian experience. And yet, you look at the children, you look at the, you talk to the people, you speak to elderly women, you see the strength, you hear a woman, you know, talk about her six children being killed, and yet, with all the sadness, there's this dignity that's been maintained. And, you know, our only wish, of course, is that more people would see this so that they understand what we're talking about. We're talking about a nation of of, of, of people who are, who are, who are unique in their ability to maintain their dignity and, the, and, 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 and to keep their spirit alive. And that's, of course, that's that's what inspires, I think, all of us that, that keep going, that connection with those people. And it also maintains our, not just our hope that it's possible, but our desire to do everything we possibly can to see the suffering end, to see this apartheid dismantled, to see a free democratic Palestine where these people can live and go back to their lands and, 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 and worship where they want to worship and live the way they want to live and raise these beautiful, beautiful, sweet children. So that is, of course, without a doubt, the biggest source of hope and inspiration and, and also the drive to get this done and to end this suffering once and for all with a political solution that is that that is that is you know, permanent. Uh, Palestine is the moral center of the world, isn't it? Um, Bush famously said, you're either with us or against us. Uh, that same dichotomy exists on Palestine. You are either in favor of those committing genocide or you're on the side of those suffering it. It's quite a simple. They try to make it out as if it's complicated, Miko, but it's actually a common or garden case of white European colonization, extirpation of the native, like they did in Tasmania, successfully, they have not been able to do to the Palestinians. And that's their problem, isn't it? Yes, you're, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, I have a, I have a, I have a good friend, a Jewish elderly gentleman, activist who lives here in the United States. And he says, well, I, uh, I reject uh, racism. What's your, what's, you know, what's your perspective? You know, where do you stand? Yeah, there's no, there's no, there's no other place to stand. You either support genocide or you oppose genocide. It's very, very simple. And when you realize, once people do realize that the genocide began with the inception of the state of Israel, with the creation of the state of Israel, then it makes it even more simple. Because if you understand what the source of the problem is, what the source of the violence is, you need to dismantle that and to allow something better to take its place. And that's really what we're talking about. One process to dismantle the apartheid regime which is responsible for the violence and 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 and, and is perpetuating the, the the genocide and on the other to start building this hopeful vision creating seeing this vision materialize of a free democratic palestine with equal rights and putting in mechanisms putting in place real mechanisms to allow the refugees to return so this is very very simple actually you don't have to invent the wheel it's been done before and then this will, without any question, allow the people who live in historic Palestine, whether they're Jews or Muslims or Christians and so on, or whoever, to, to live in peace, to live a normal life, uh, finally. This is the remedy. This is the magic, the, the magic, you know, the, the magic pill, pill, if you will. Well, it is Easter. We can hope for resurrection indeed. Thank you, Miko Pellet, for, as always, a dazzling tour the horizon. Miko Peled, Israeli author and activist. Thanks for joining us. Who would be the UK's best prime minister? Rishi Sunak, Keir Starmer or me? It's a simple question, really. And people, <laughs> I can't believe that number I've just seen there. 1% <laughs> for Starmer, 98% for me. Let's take a quick break and then the show is yours right up to the end. Stay tuned. Let me uh, say that you can listen to the audio-only version of Moats on our Moats podcast, and the numbers on that are going through the roof. 
Just search Moats with George Galloway on Apple, Spotify, Google, or whichever platform you listen to your podcasts on. In recent weeks, it's been the number one political podcast in Benin, Jordan, the Gambia, Qatar, Jamaica, Ghana, Iceland, Malaysia, Singapore, Sweden, and the Philippines. Number one political podcast in all those countries. Truly, truly phenomenal. Do you know that BBC News has lost 40% of its audience in the last few years? It's official. And of course, that is the sensible thing to do. But to get people to tune in and change course and listen to a radically different point of view is even more difficult. But it's happening. And the numbers that we are racking up are now in their millions. You are listening to the mother of all talk shows with George Galloway. Now, don't forget, if you've just joined the show, uh, but you want a bite-sized version of it, you can download the Moats podcast by scanning the QR code on your screen now. This week, we were in the top 20 in the Netherlands, in the top five in Nigeria. It is an international university of the airwaves, indeed. Celine Jean says, George Galloway, you are the Churchill of 2024. Too tired tonight. Love moats each time. Thank you, Celine, for that. Anthony Lombardi says, the live chat is half the reason why I watch this show. Wow. Who knew? Alpaca on my bag says, everyone give yourselves a pat on the back. We did it. And the DAT573 says, bishops and priests beheaded. I don't know that story. Can you please recommend a site with that history? Uh, Thank you. Well, it's, uh, uh, I'm afraid, a well-charted and uh, miserable part of the whole ISIS, Al-Qaeda, Syria story. You can Google it. Let's go back to the lines. Ray is in Wales on the UK's complicity with that genocide we've been talking about. Ray, welcome to the show. Hi, George. How are you? Well, first of all, uh, congratulations on your election victory. That's absolutely fantastic. I am a member of the Wales Thanks, Party, Ray. so that was uh, great. I joined okay. last year. Um, now, Sir Jeffrey Lovely. Nice, he's, uh, Sir Jeffrey Nice, he's a British judge. He's also the lead prosecutor at the Slobodan Lawson trial. He's uh, stated that he thinks that the legal advice that the government has received should be made public because he believes that the UK is of aiding and abetting in criminal activity. Now, my question is, why is there no reporting on the BBC, Sky, Channel 4, the Daily Mail, on the radio, on the, on the, other, on the papers? Are these people making the decision themselves to censor themselves, or do you think they are being pressurized into not talking about this? And another point is, do you think that our um, support for Israel might be guilt because of uh, the Holocaust and because of the way that we ourselves treated uh, the Jewish people between 1933 and 1945? Well, never mind 1933 to 1945. There was a thousand years of pogroms. Uh, The the pogrom of York springs to mind. A thousand years of pogroms and uh, and prejudice, bigotry, hatred, violence, discrimination against Jewish people in Britain. Uh, The Jews have been persecuted uh, everywhere in Europe. Uh, And uh, so if there is guilt, it's quite right uh, that there is guilt. We could, for example, have created the state of Israel in the highlands of Scotland if we were feeling that guilty. The obvious place, uh, if guilt were the basis of our action, uh, would be to divide Germany. (laughs) We should have remained divided in any case break Germany up into its historic principalities, pre-Bismarcky and principalities, and give one of those uh, for a Jewish state. Uh, There's a Jewish state till this day in Russia, an autonomous 
Jewish state within Russia. There is nothing per se against uh, punishing uh, the crimes of European fascism and the crimes by omission of those who collaborated with European fascism, who turned their backs on the Jewish people, who slammed the door in the face of people fleeing from the incipient uh, European fascism that was to lead to uh, the Holocaust and the gas chambers. There's nothing per se wrong with punishing that uh, with a territorial uh, imposition uh, of, a, of a Jewish state. My point is, that the Palestinian people had nothing whatsoever to do with uh, the persecution of the Jews. Palestine and the Arab world more generally was the only place you could be a Jew and not be persecuted. Until the rise of Zionism, Jews and Christians and Muslims in the Holy Land lived harmoniously cheek by jowl with each other. It was the invention of Zionism itself which brought this virus of hatred, division, and ultimately deadly violence into the Holy Land. So why punish the Palestinians for the crimes of the Germans, the Romanians, the Hungarians, the collaborators, active collaborators, Ukrainians, perhaps above all in the, in the Holocaust? Why punish the Palestinians for that. They did nothing to deserve all of this. So uh, guilt, maybe, uh, Ray, uh, that plays a part in it, but our country stood alone against Nazi Germany uh, for a time, a crucial time, uh, under the leadership of Winston Churchill, who declared that we would not surrender and would fight on and we uh, therefore influence the ultimate course of events in our alliance with the United States and above all the former Soviet Union, we help to crush the beast of fascism in its lair in uh, Berlin. Uh, so uh, there's no particular reason why 75 years later, it would be guilt that would be driving what is quite evidently not just a totally immoral policy of support for the genocide in Gaza, uh, but a policy that is deeply, deeply uh, contrary to our own national interest. We are ready to shred even our own ancient freedoms, it appears, in order to facilitate, collaborate with that genocide. That's the principal problem, Ray. Thanks for your great call. Uh, Jenny is in Blackpool on Rishi Sunak. Go ahead, Jenny. Hello, George. Congratulations. Um, Thank I, you. Uh, I, um, about Sunak, I think he's hanging on till after May to, to so he can sign us over to the sign our sovereignty over to the WHO. What do you think? I don't think that, that I think his ambitions are uh, less um, grand than that. He just wants to hang on in there, to hang on in there. Nobody likes to leave 10 Downing Street. Remember, Jenny, how Mrs. Thatcher cried? Only time we ever saw it was when she got into that taxi. Uh, taking her out of 10 Downing Street. Nobody likes to leave it, and especially when they've not been elected to it and uh, have served an ignominiously short period of time. Whether he'll succeed in hanging on must be in doubt. If the election results on May the 2nd go very badly, he has only two options. One is to go more or less immediately for a general election, that being the only way he can avoid the second option, which is that the Tory MPs boot him out just as they booted out his predecessor, her predecessor, and their predecessor before that. So the Tory MPs are going to kick Sunak out after May the 2nd, unless he forestalls that 
by asking the king uh, for a more or less immediate general election in June or even in July. Thanks, Jenny, uh, for that uh, call. Mind over matter, BJJ 420. I wish we had politicians like Mr. Galloway in the United States. I can't think of one other than maybe Jill Stein, Dr. Jill Stein, good friend of me and Gayatri, and we wish her every success in the forthcoming presidential poll. DF and V says, George, talk some sense to Keir Starmer, please. <laughs> well, Nicola Curtin says, I can't believe how patient Hussam Zamlot is with our interviewers, who really are beyond vile. And Elise Dallaire says, this is a no-brainer. Galloway, 1,000%. This would be a dream come true. I live in Canada. I wish we had a George Galloway. I love his whole family. Thank you, Elise, for those kind words. Uh, let's go to Peter in Greater Manchester and Berry on Palestine. Go ahead, Peter. Hello, George. Uh, thank you for taking my call. And, um, and God bless you for what you've done in Rochdale. I'm, I'm only next door. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, we're coming. Uh, let's, we're coming to Bury. I hope you are. Uh, there's, a many, there's many, many, many yeah. friends of mine who will vote, and I know that for a fact. Uh, yeah. I last spoke to you, I think yeah. you was on a radio show, talk show, and I spoke to you about my great dad who passed away in February 21. He was the last living tank driver of the Royal Scots Grays, and I think you quite remember that because oh, yeah. you were taken, you do, were taken back with that message. It, yeah. Well, God bless you for yeah. that. I now I want to tell you what I what okay. I'm very spiritual and uh, I've, uh, we we all have this gift. Everyone has this gift. Uh, it's just that it's been suppressed by education uh, and uh, over the years, which you just said is the Zionist education that that has constantly drummed us down. Now, what I see is happening, and I I, I had this kind of like little vision of uh, at the beginning of the year that by the end of 24 we will not see the Israel flag on the Middle East. Uh, they're going to press the button. I don't mean the button. They're going to do something which is completely stupid, uh, which I think it could be a, a really massive land invasion of, uh, of Rafa. They want to push the, uh, the Palestinian people into the Sinai. And the reason why they want to push them into the Sinai is because of a, a company that is trying to do the similar to what they want to do in uh, Israel. It's called BlackRock. BlackRock, uh, I've, I have seen reports about this, that BlackRock, well, hoping that uh, Russia will lose the war, which there's no chance of that, I do not think. But they want to create smart cities all over Ukraine. Uh, this has been the back of the, the big philanthropists like George Soros, etc., with the money. Uh, BlackRock has, uh, has got money behind that, and it will use the United States as enforcement to make sure this is done. They want to do the same. I'm kind of worried about the uh, the land bridge that they want to put on the the, the pier that the Yanks are wanting to build. Uh, I hope it is for humanitarian. Um, but uh, I I did again saw these uh, this information that various cities in Gaza is going to be for the uh, the Israeli elite to uh, to use as virtually like a um, uh, like the the big condominiums you get off off the Californian coast. Uh, and they want to turn it into a smart cities up and down that, that, that patch, along with the biggest investment which will come, which is the Ben Gurion Canal, which is investments of United Kingdom, France, and the United States, with a little puppy dog of, uh, of Justin Castro, oh, sorry, it's Trudeau, I should have said, not Castro, that was his father. Uh, they, want to, they, they, they are also financing it, and they're hoping that this will go, and that's why they want to clean away uh, of the various people in the Israeli cabinet, uh, which is uh, is that Benen, Ali Korn, Yuval Galant, Benny Gantz, they're all as mad as that as these people. They, they, I've never known anybody. They actually make the uh, the Goebbels and uh, and that look pretty sane. What they've done in the three months, if they carried on, I think to the rest of this year, uh, they they would. They would virtually make the rest of what Hitler's cabinet look like choir boys. Uh, it's disgusting how the West. No, is nothing. Uh, nothing. Uh, no, uh, thanks, Peter. Uh, uh, nothing would ever make Goebbels and Hitler uh, seem like choir boys. They were the ultimate genociders. Uh, they murdered more people than anybody ever has 
and one likes to hope ever will, in the uh, course of their uh, bestial tyranny uh, over Germany and then the territories occupied by Germany and the Holocaust of the East and the Holocaust of the West will never be surpassed. So it's the capital H Holocaust. But no one could dispute that the genocidal intent and the genocidal actions uh, that are taking place in Gaza uh, are uh, a small holocaust. No one can dispute that. Only if they want to, um, to make uh, moral relativism uh, their guide to what genocides are genocides and what genocides are less than genocides. And we wouldn't entertain that here on the mother of all talk shows. We don't believe there are any chosen people. We don't believe there are any exceptional people. Uh, we believe that we are all God's children, equal one of the other, and everyone has inalienable human rights uh, that we will defend uh, against whomsoever uh, seeks to violate them, seeks to trample them uh, underfoot. I don't believe there will ever be Soros, BlackRock, smart cities anywhere in Ukraine. Uh, there might not even be a Ukraine unless these idiots in Kiev don't negotiate an end to this pretty damn quickly. But there'll definitely not be any Soros, BlackRock, smart cities in Ukraine. And notwithstanding uh, you being able to see the future better than me, Peter, I don't believe it will be achieved in Gaza either. Uh, Karim Akwizi says, Boycott Burger King, McDonald's, KFC, Domino Pizza, and Marks and & Spencer. And Diogenes says, Smotrich, Ukrainian, Herzl, Austro-Hungarian of Serbian descent, Jabotinsky, Russian, born in Odessa. How can Europeans claim Western Asia as their own? And C. Coco uh, says, let's all just move to the moon until Israel feels safe. Let's go to the legend in New York, Erobos on freedom of speech. Erobos, welcome back. Greetings and salutations, the Right Honorable Minister of Parliament, His Excellency, His Eminence, George Galloway. Salubrious health to yourself, the Workers' Party, and your fine family. I've missed some of this show slash program due to having a late start. However, I wanted the opportunity to share a thought that I've been developing on this same theme that's been the undertow as well as child on top of the actual show, which is fascism. I'm fully aware that I live in a country that has a robust constitution about the uh, free speech, uh, First Amendment. However, I've come to develop the view that fascism has nothing to do with free speech. And I, I believe it should be and must be outlawed. Now, there's a part of it where people join, right, because they feel hopeless in their communities and they blame, uh, they blame the Mexicans, they blame the immigrants for taking their jobs. Education and um, investment in their communities can help these people. Right? They, they join because they've been bamboozled and they've been had their brains smoothened down and conditioned into believing that it's the other. And they don't know or they forgot about NAFTA, which pushed their jobs outside of the country, which is centralized in China. And you can't blame China for, you know, basically owning capitalism and, and um, basically have controlling that instead of the other way around. But inside of fascism, yeah. they are complete ideologues, right? They are people who truly believe this. And the, the issue I have is that these people, they don't believe in free speech for anybody else. They don't believe in human rights for anyone else. They, in fact, you know, as you, as you just finished excellently uh, and eloquently stating to the previous caller and to every other caller, you know, ad infinitum, that, you know, these people, when they get power, they do the same things over and over, which is exterminate everybody else, take away the free speech rights, 
break unions, throw their people uh, up, opponents in jail, outright kill them. I've seen some of Einstein Gruppen. I haven't seen the whole thing. I've managed to download all four uh, copies. And, you know, they, they do the same thing over and over and over, whether it's, um, you know, the, these different the Italian fascists or the Spanish fascists or, um, you know, the guy in, Argent or in Chile. Wherever they go, they replicate the same model. So this has to be outlawed. And, you know, the Constitution has been amended 23 times or something like that. I believe an amendment should be in place to, to outlaw and ban fascism, root, branch, and everywhere else, you know. And, um, yeah, I've just, I just been, because it, 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 it's been eating at me like a splinter in the brain for quite some time, that this cannot be a free speech issue if the people you're advocating for in themselves, not only at the risk of being redundant, not only do not believe in free speech, but when they get into power, are going to do everything they can to prevent everybody else free speech. And then they, they, they start their program of shoving people onto cattle cars or just exterminate them from view like they're doing in Palestine. So just a, a thought I wanted to, uh, to, to share. And, you know, I'll hand it over to you and, and to the Moats audience. Well, uh, if, ever, if, ever, if ever the word uh, just was otios, it was there. If that was just a thought of yours, then we are uh, very lucky indeed to be the recipient of your thoughts. That was one of the most powerful of all calls to the mother of all talk shows. And delivered in a voice that all the men listening would very much like to have, and even some of the women. Caroline from Cope Bridge says, I wish I had a voice like a robust, only the female version. Brilliantly profound, and we're all deeply grateful for it, a robust. Thank you very much. Indeed, let me go live to my own good wife, Gayatri. What's rattling, Gayatri? Well, I've measured the curtains and I've got the designs in place, so that's all good. <laughs> the poll is going very well. We're moving, you know. darling, again to Downing Street. But I've got to tell you, with six children, Downing Street is going to be a bit cramped for us. Maybe we'll ask for checkers. <laughs> Who would be the UK's best Prime Minister? Lisa Roddy says, a choice between a banker involved in the 2008 financial crash, a Zionist liar, or a man who has been on the right side of history all along and has risked life and limb to bring truth to us. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much, and Marcy Lisa, Grant thank you. Was A banker, I mean, what a choice. A banker, a plonker, or me. I mean, no wonder it's a landslide. <laughs> Marcy asked whether we can have George Galway as president of the US and uh, this is a very good one from Tom Alas, Orr. No, I says, wasn't born there. Yeah, you weren't born there uh, despite your um, American blood in you, right? Um, Rashid yeah, Sunuk yeah. will easily vote because he doesn't need any votes to win, says Tom Orr. <laughs> very good, very good. Oh, um, Here's a very good email from uh, Kevin, uh, no, Campbell Kevin. He says, George, congratulations and keep fighting God's fight and say a prayer for me. The houses of cards are falling and I believe it won't be long until normal everyday people will see evil people, elites of the world gone. Christ has risen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. I think it's Kevin Campbell, uh, our friend, yeah. the footballer. Yeah. Uh, and if it is, a big salute to Kevin Campbell uh, of, uh, of uh, formerly of various parishes in the English top flight football. Anyway, uh, yeah, I, I think that he's right about that. There's plenty of cause for optimism. Uh, it's true that our rulers uh, are a, a sorry state of affairs, but the good news is they've never been so hated. They've never been so disregarded, so disrespected, yeah. uh, that uh, they can scarcely go anywhere uh, because so many people hate and dislike them uh, so much. And insofar as they ever vote for them, it's only where there's nobody else decent to vote for. 
And that's why we're doing everything we can, the length and breadth of the country, to give them somebody better to vote for. Any any more, Gatry? One or two more? No. Um, so Stephanie Carroll says, George, on Wednesday, you dubbed Jackson Hinkle as the young George Galloway. Another young George Galloway is, yeah. to me, Richard Medhurst. And I wish he could be persuaded yeah. to run for MP and stand by your side in Parliament. What a great team you would make, at least until you move to Downing Street. <laughs> well, let me give you uh, the breaking news. I'm doing just that. I'm working on the wonderful Richie Medhurst to be a Workers' Party candidate in the forthcoming general election. Watch this space. Yep. And finally, um, as we shown the clip last week of Have It Out with Galloway, our new show, lots of people have shown interest. Did people like it? Yes. Yes, they love it, uh, and especially the uh, the aspect of uh, joining the show online. So here uh, is the way yeah, to do it. Yeah. Go to www.haveitoutwithgalloway.com, and that's where you can uh, register to uh, join the show online. Malacca Media's latest baby, haveitoutwithgalloway.com. Why don't you? As I always say, Gayatri, come and have a go if you think you're hard <laughs> Thanks very much indeed for that social media roundup. See you after the show, darling. Uh, who would be UK's best Prime Minister, Sunak, Starmer or me? Well, the poll has closed. 57,512 people have voted. On Telegram, 1% said Rishi Sunak, 1% said Keir Starmer. And 98% said me. On Twitter, 4% said Rishi Sunak, 7% said Keir Starmer, and 89% said me. On YouTube community, 3% said Rishi Sunak, 2% said Keir Starmer, and 95% said George Galloway. And on the YouTube stream, it was 2, 3, and 95, 59,099 people voted. So over the next couple of days, that will rise over the 60,000 mark. Not scientific, but a big poll and a pretty big win. Andrew Holt says, I wish you could come to Walsall, West Midlands, and get somebody as an MP I don't know where to vote for anymore. I can't vote for Labour and have never voted Tory. Andrew, we'll be there in Walsall and throughout the West Midlands. Trust me on that. You'll have somebody to vote for. And Omar Rana says, many Jews all over the world support Palestine. Much love to all of them. Amen to that, Omar. Uh, what might be the last call of the evening? Sean in London on Palestine. Go ahead, Sean. Evening, Mr. Galloway. Um, first of all, um, congratulations on the monumental win in Rochdale. Congratulations Thanks. to the people of Rochdale for having um, someone of your caliber um, in their corner. <clears throat> My okay. question, um, okay. I'll keep it short, is I've uh, recently um, re-listened to um, a podcast that Mr. Netanyahu was on. It's um, the Lex Friedman podcast. Um, about 40 minutes in, he starts talking about peace in the Middle East, and uh, it, it's a very worrying situation because essentially I'm getting the sense that he has so much faith in the fact that the Israelis have such good relations with the majority of the Arabic world. But then when you see the protests on the streets, it seems that the people are not in the same sort of mentality. So where, mm. where, how does this end? Because it, it, essentially, I, I'm frightened that we're going to see that kind of Arab Springs that will, where, where, when. Well, where, you're frightened, Sean. I'm uh, look. I'm, I'm hoping. I'm hoping for. Uh, I, I mean, either the Arab rulers are going to have to change their attitude, or the people will change them. Uh, I, I mean, no doubt that we are in the beginning of a new Arab Spring, it will be called the Gaza Spring. Uh, and uh, when I see the scale of the demonstrations in Jordan, for example, 
and in uh, Cairo where it is possible, as it was at an iftar the other night in downtown Cairo. I study Egyptian affairs and developments extremely closely, and at football stadia and so on, where the, the regime can do nothing about the huge mass of the people gathered there. Uh, it's undoubtedly the case that the Arab masses are moving. Uh, the tectonic plates in the Arab world are shifting. And some rulers, uh, like the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, are moving their country's position uh, for fear of that kind of development uh, affecting their uh, country. In fact, uh, the crown prince said, I think today, uh, that the radicalization of the youth of Arabia as a result of these crimes that they are all seeing, no one can stop them from seeing, uh, is a threat to stability and a threat to uh, economic uh, progress and, and diversification and all the plans that he has. Uh, and so he is adjusting at least the rhetoric uh, that he uses uh, towards the Israelis, towards the issues of so-called normalization and so on. But if these rulers don't uh, move their position, they'll be overthrown uh, by uh, their own masses because the mass of the Arab world, all the way from the Atlantic right to the Persian Gulf, is unequivocal and overwhelming. And in the end, uh, when the people are united, uh, they can never be uh, defeated. Sean, great call. There is one last call. It's Danny in Liverpool, and I do want to take it. Danny, welcome to the show. Hi there, George. Um, big congrats um, for winning Hi. in Rochdale. I'm just down the road, as you know, in Liverpool. Um, I've been watching your show now yes. for a good few weeks, and, um, you know, it, it's pretty, uh, for once, intelligent, you know, an intelligent debate, what I'm hearing. And then one of the questions I want to throw to you is, like, circa around about 2010, uh, the great rise in either extreme left and extreme right in politics now, there doesn't seem to be any reasonable centre ground like there used to be in, in our politics here in the UK, but also across the greater West. You know, no, Western civilization, in my view, seems to be that of uh, either you're in 100% in one camp or 100% in the other, and to have a voice in the middle anymore, you're essentially uh, quashed, you know, Um and one kind of like interesting thing that comes to mind was back when you were hauled in front of the U.S. Senate uh, just after, I think, the end of the Iraq war, um, you know, some of the baseless kind of accusations that were thrown at you back then. And you were right all along then, you know, just as you're right all along now. And, it, it, you know, if, I, mm. if a few more people had have listened to you, you know, we wouldn't be in the situation. Well, beautiful, Danny. Beautiful. I, I'm grateful uh, for it. I'm sorry to cut you short, but I'm already over the hour. Uh, um, let me just tell you two stats. Little soldier Schultz, the Chancellor of Germany, is disapproved of by 73% of the German voters. And bonkers Baerbock uh, is almost as heavily disapproved of, 73%. Little Macron has a disapproval rating of 72%, just one point less disastrous than little Schultz. The great majority of people in the United States disapprove of the performance of President Joe Biden. I don't think they would even bother polling in Britain uh, to find out what percentage of the British people disapproved of little Rishi Sunak. Just ponder that. One, two, three, four of the most significant Western countries are ruled by politicians whom the vast majority of their own electorate feel nothing but contempt for them, despise them and would have them out, will have them out, just as soon as they get the opportunity to do so. The center cannot hold. 
the center is a busted flush. Everybody knows uh, that the politics of globalized capitalism, the WEF, uh, the Bill Gates, the George Soros, and so on, is designed to beggar them. Everyone has already tumbled to that truth. Everyone believes that these so-called centrist governments and all of those four governments, and you could add in uh, blackface Justin Trudeau, uh, there's five, you could add in many more, I'm sure. Uh, everybody knows that these governments do not serve their interests and that these governments have no project, have no plan that can remotely be described as a plan likely to succeed. Uh, they are doubling down on failure, reinforcing failure, throwing good money after bad, and everybody knows it. The problem is, in many countries, there is not yet in place a project that can, if taken at the flood, lead to good fortune for the mass of the people, particularly in the United States. I'm here in Britain. And there are others like me who will seek to give the British people the opportunity of taking that sea of contempt for the centrist globalist politicians to take that flood uh, to good fortune. In France, there is a, a person like me called Jean-Luc Mélenchon. In Germany, there is now a person like me Sarah Wagenkecht and her new party uh, in Germany. We are the future. I'm a bit old uh, to fully uh, devote the time that's necessary, 20 years or so, uh, that will uh, be able to steer our countries forward. But our main problem is that in the United States, it is a desert a political desert. There's no one like me, like Melanchon, like Wagenkecht in the United States. There will have to be some genuine leader who's not in hock to all the forces of wickedness and evil in the world will have to emerge and will have to come to power in the United States. If humanity is to thrive, if humanity is even to survive. It's been marvelous for me. I hope it was for you. It's been a great show, I think, with two top guests. And the good news is that, uh, God willing, I'll be back on Wednesday at the same time. From the same place, it's the mother of all talk shows. Thanks for watching.